Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by First Paw Coffee Company, specializing in private label premium blend coffee. If you're serious about coffee, you should check it out. First Paw Coffee's passion is high quality, small batch roasted coffee. They take the extra time to taste and get everything perfect before they release new blends. They aim to bring you a cup of happiness each time you pour yourself some coffee. Find out more at ak.dog slash free and enter for a chance to win some First Paw Coffee prizes, a book from our collection and tote bag. One winner will be selected at random each month. That's ak.dog slash free. Radio Free Palmer 89.5 KVRF presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome everybody. You're listening to Mushing Radio here on KVRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley. RadioFreePalmer.org is our live streaming site. You can find all of our episodes over on DogWorksRadio.com. And be sure to check out us on social media at DogWorks Radio. And today I am joined by a gentleman calling in from Indiana. He is the race director for the Pedigree Stage Stop. His name is Dan Carter. Dan, how's it going today? I'm doing pretty well today. How are you, Robert? I am fine. Thank you. Dan, can you do us a favor and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're all about, please? Sure. So, uh, uh, related to sled dog sports, um, I uh, have a mushing background. Uh, started mushing in 1995 in northern Minnesota. Um, working in the tour business and then uh, migrated into racing. Um, out of uh, Frank Teasley's kennel in Wyoming, and um, eventually uh, sort of stepped stepped off the runners uh, after about ten years of, of uh, you know full time dog mushing, and uh, and came back on into the scene I guess uh, as the chief timer for the stage stop the pedigree stage stop did that for a couple years and then uh, and then took over as race director uh, from Frank Teasley uh, after he had, he's the race founder and he's been the director for about 18 years. So Dan, I took a look at your bio before we went on air and you have a pretty impressive racing resume. You did a heck of a lot of uh, what were known as mid distance race, as well as the Iditarod, I believe in 2007, uh, what do you think, uh, getting involved with the sport, what do you think about the difference between the different styles of race, and especially now that you're involved with the stage stop, compared to, you know, the shorter races and the longer races, and here we are with uh, a different format with the stage racing? Yeah, well, you know, I, I uh, you know, any, any time, you know, you're on the runners out in beautiful country, it's, it's a privilege. Um and, you know, the, the stage format racing is kind of more of a, uh, a, a, a social type of an event, um, even though, you know, you're, you're out on the trail by yourself. Uh, you see most of your competitors on the trail every day. You get to look at their dog teams. Um, you get to uh, spend time in the uh, staging areas. Um, and there's typically some kind of a so- social function uh, every day or every other day. Um, you get a lot of interaction with the vet crew, and it's a great environment for uh, uh, mushers to improve their skill sets uh, through that that environment. Um, you know, it can be a little hectic with uh, um, having to get you know to a, a starting line every morning. Um, that's always a little bit nerve wracking, uh, or can be anyway. Um, and then you know, with with the distance racing, what I really liked about distance racing was, you know, um, sort of once you got off the starting line and you were out on the trail, then it was you and your team for an extended period of time and, and it really got, gave you a chance to 
to really just fully focus on, um, um, you know, taking care of that dog team and, and navigating the, the, the trail and, and uh, trying to, to uh, get to a finish line that's quite a long way away. Um, you know, with Iditarod, that was a race that I, you know, from the time I, I started mushing and, and knew what the Iditarod was, it was a goal of mine. And, uh, there's nothing quite like uh, coming off the ice on the front street and, and coming under that burled arch. So uh, I, I like them both for different reasons. Excellent. Uh, Dan, before we jump over into talking about the stage stop, I'm intrigued about something you had in your bio about the 1400 mile canoe trip. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, my, my first job out of college, uh, I, I wanted to travel around a bit and, and, and see the United States and, and, and Canada. Um, so I worked at a lodge up in the Boundary Waters as a canoe guide and uh, had a big map of the entire North Woods from Lake Superior uh, up to the, uh, you know, uh, Arctic Ocean. And um, I was just intrigued by all these these water routes and uh, started to to do some research and educated myself on, you know, the fur trade and the westward expansion of, of North America and uh, decided that I wanted to try and do this trip. And I initially, I was looking for a travel partner and, uh, and that was in uh, the mid nineties. And I, I never convinced anybody to commit to it. And, uh, but it never left my mind. And, and uh, 2003, I decided I was going to go for it just solo. And so I paddled from, from the Grand Portage at Lake Superior and followed the Minnesota-Ontario border to Lake of the Woods, headed north across there, picked up the Winnipeg River um, into Lake Winnipeg and, and paddled up the eastern shore of Lake Winnipeg. Um, then, you know, into the Nelson River and, and picked up the Etchamamish uh, and uh, eventually into the Hayes River drainage, and then crossed over into the Gods River drainage, and and, and took the Gods River down back to the Hayes, and and finished at York. Is the was the the hub of North American fur trade for the Hudson's Bay Company, and uh, uh, stayed there a night and explored a bit, and then called in a float plane and took me back to. Uh, eventually by train to Winnipeg. Very interesting. You had mentioned, Dan, that uh, when you ran Iditarod, it's it's pretty much as soon as you you uh, leave Anchorage and or Willow here, you're out on your own. How did that trip, uh, that canoe trip, prepare you, if at all, for a race like Iditarod? You know, I think it did. Um, I mean, that trip definitely had its, its challenges. And, you know, once you, once you get... Um, up to Lake Winnipeg, uh, it's remote, uh, roadless, uh, you know, uh, First Nation uh, villages. Um, Lake Winnipeg has some can have some 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 big water on it from from wind wind blown waves. Uh, uh, you know, being very remote, having to you know be cautious and and take care of yourself so <laughs> you can finish the trip. Uh, you know, I would say that was definitely good preparation for I did a rod. Um, you know, I, I was, for me, I did a rod. I felt like I was ready when I got there, um, to, to do that race that I built the skill sets that were necessary. And I think for that reason, I really enjoyed the, I did a rod, you know, uh, immensely. Interesting. Let's move over into the stage stop. And I really want to spend some time on this episode talking about what you guys are planning with uh, 
with COVID and all that. But before that, we've had a heck of a bunch of uh, racers on our other show, The Dog Driver, that I host with my friend Karosh. Uh, we've had previous champions and I believe last year's champion as well. But coming from a uh, more of a distance background, I'm not as familiar with these folks as I am. You know, I did a rod and all of that. So let's talk a little bit about the race itself. This has been a race that's been around a long time. I remember reading about it uh, when I first got started in mushing in the early 90s. And it is one of those bucket list races for a lot of mushers. They have that on on their on their notepad as something they want to do in their careers. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the race, how it got started, when it got started, and what was the the original vision, and how has that changed today? Well, the race, the first race, was in 1996. And, you know, the race was founded by, by Frank Teasley, who came from a distance mushing background, uh, seven or eight time I did a ride veteran and, and distance musher. And uh, he wanted to put on a, a race that was like a musher's race, you know, where people could show up and, and run their dogs and, and that was their primary focus. And it initially was a much longer race. Um, now most of the stages, all of the stages now are out and back. Uh, so you run out, uh, run a loop and come back to the finish. But, uh, those first dozen or so years, it was point to point and the runs were quite a bit longer. And so I got to hand it to Frank, uh, with just the logistical management of, of the event when it was formatted that way from setting up the starting, uh, staging area, starting line, and getting everybody out on the trail, and then having that whole uh, race race staging crew and timers uh, load up and uh, take a road route around the mountain range to where the mushers were going to finish and, and be there to catch them with a stopwatch when they, when they came across. Um, and it was, I think, an 11-day race that had four overnight campouts and it was at that time it was my dinner out qualifier. Um, and initially, I mean, it drew, I mean, Rick Swenson won the first race. Um, you know, a lot of big name mushers have, uh, from Alaska distance mushers were coming down. Jacques Philippe, Hans Scott, four time champion. Uh, you know, Doug Swingley and, uh, and Melanie Sherilla, his partner at the time. Uh, were showing up every year. Ken, Ken Anderson and, and Gwen Holdman were coming down, building two teams. Um, and uh, now, uh, I guess to back up a second, what, what the race has always tried to do is just keep pace with uh, the, the, the mushing environment and the type of race that will continue to draw competitors uh, to keep the race you know, viable and active. And over time, uh, we've shortened the race. So there's, uh, it's significant. There's less of a time commitment for mushers that are maybe traveling a long distance. And, you know, we've shortened the runs because, you know, uh, uh, some things have changed, I guess, in the mushing world, at least as far as the lower 48, perhaps, um, you know, with, uh, a lot of those those kennels that were bringing two very competitive teams have, have retired from the sport, and we started to see interest from kennels like the Trooper Kennel, the Gilbertson Kennel, uh, that were you know more sprint type kennels, and um, we we kind of changed the format to keep pace. And uh, the event is currently very strong. We've got a great title sponsor and pedigree, and um, you know, we, we filled the field uh, the last couple of years, um, and we expect that to continue. So it, it's, it always has been, and it still is a very strong event. So, Dan, there's also a um, uh, um, another race along with that as, as well, an eight-dog race. Am I right? Well, we did. We did start. start I started uh, what was the Yukonuba uh, eight-dog classic. And I think the first year for that was, I don't know, say, 2014 or 15. And the idea there was, and at that time, we were trying to bring more teams in. And the idea was to have 
a, a parallel event that was shorter uh, that could bring in uh, competitors either who had a smaller kennel and couldn't didn't feel comfortable fielding the full pool of, of at the time 16 dogs uh, or you know regional mushers who, who couldn't take the time could, could make the trip but couldn't take that full time off and also maybe mushers who had, like you said maybe had had the stage stop on their bucket list but, you know, weren't quite sure, weren't sure if they were ready, and maybe just wanted to take a kind of a peek and, and see, you know, how the race is structured, what the organization is like. And 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 we, we were successful, and we did pull several uh, mushers from that Eight Dog Classic into, uh, in future years, into the stage stop. Um, Austin Forney is one example, a musher out of Leadville, Colorado, ran the first eight dog race and then uh, came back and ran the, the, the full, the main event. Uh, and it's been here every year since then. Uh, and it's been interesting to watch him, you know, really come up and, and improve his kennel and improve his, his level of competitiveness in the stage stop. But um, when we made our last format change and, and, kept all the mileages between 30 and 35 miles. That, that was a hard decision, which is um, something else we could talk about. But when we finally decided to make that kind of full transition from maybe mid-distance type race to more of a, a, a quicker uh, stage format race, we saw our numbers just shot up. I mean, when we made that change, we announced it in August, and I think in two days we had filled the full field. So now for us to try and manage, you know, a full field of 25 teams plus uh, uh, 10 or 12 more teams in a smaller race uh, became uh, maybe a little more of an effort than we thought was worth it. And um, we decided to put our full focus back on the, the main race. And so we had, we last year and this year we did not have a, a dog race. Gotcha. Uh, the the uh, pedigree stage stop is is much different than most of the other races that are available in this country. Uh, we have, of course, many uh, weekend sprint races that one or two day, then a few of those three day races like the Fur Rondi and the uh, Open North American and, and races like that. Uh, from a logistical standpoint, Dan, since you are the race director, you're really putting on seven days of races in in locations that are spread out over hundreds of miles. Is that right? Yeah, that that's true. So can you tell us a little bit about that? What, maybe not, you know, a, a tick by tick, but what is the planning process to get something like this off the ground? You know, you're starting at one location and you're finishing a week later. From a behind the scenes perspective, how much work goes into that? Oh, well, quite a bit. Um, you know, this, this as director, it's not my, my full-time job. I, I, I have a business that I run, as well as the assistant director, um, a race marshal, our media director. Um, so we all put quite a bit of time in. It's kind of a part-time job in the racing off-season, and then as we get closer, it, it, it starts demanding more time. Um, and in a normal year, we would have a, a big ceremonial start in downtown Jackson canceled that year this year as part of our COVID plan but uh you know that's a big to do where they they shut down you know a couple miles of the streets in in Jackson uh, instead of plowing snow they they put you know that back down on the street for us to build a race course um you know it's at night so we bring in light towers and a uh a big jumbotron screen. Uh, last year we did a laser light show. So it's, it is a production and that takes a lot of planning and it's a little nerve wracking because, you know, you don't get a second chance. It has to go off right the first time. Um, so once myself and the crew and, and really the competitors get, get through that first day of the ceremonial start and, and, and then head to the first stage, which is typically Alpine and get that stage under our belt, everybody kind of takes a breath and, um, 
and gets into a routine. And, um, you know, two, three days into the race, everybody's just, just gelling and moving forward. And it, and it, in most years, unless we have some crazy weather event, uh, it, it starts to feel pretty seamless once we get rolling. And this race starts right around the end of January and finishes that first week of February. So it's in prime mushing season in most parts of the country. Uh, are you guys ready to roll this year? Of course, we're leading into the, the COVID conversation. Aside from the COVID conversation, does everything else look good? Yeah. Um, we, you know, there, there is snow in Wyoming and, uh, it's been cold, so that snow's been holding. Um, what my concern always is is whether or not the cattle guards are <laughs> are getting filled in. Um, you know, those cattle guards can. There's there's a, a few legs that have have several on them. Kemmerer leg, I think, has five or six cattle guards, um, and those can get. They're they're pretty deep if you're familiar with the construction of the cattle guard. But we work with Wyoming State Trails and that runs the grooming and their groomers are aware of our event and they do their best. And when we do get a snow event, they'll try and drag snow into those uh, cattle guards and, and get them filled in. But as far as the trail is concerned, that's usually my biggest concern is uh, enough snow to fill those cattle guards. Um, you know, I can't remember who told me they said, you know, for a musher one inch is, uh, of snow is not enough and 12 inches is too much. So, Right. So Dan, for, for folks that are listening, most of our listeners are not, uh, are not dog mushers. They're not involved with the sport okay. at all. They have their fa you know, the family dog. Can you tell us a bit about, uh, the, the layout of the race? You had mentioned that you start in Jackson hole there, which is kind of a, a city environment, but you also have, uh, some mountain trails kind of tell us about what each stage is like. Yeah, so each stage is hosted by a different uh, western Wyoming town. They're small communities for the most part. Um, and uh, the, the trails that we're running on are United States Forest Service trails. Uh, so we stage at a trailhead parking lot. Uh, so other than the Jackson leg, where, where most of our staging is done remotely out in the forest at a trailhead. Um, and we run on growing trails, uh, out and back courses, uh, 30 to 35 mile runs, uh, per, per leg. Uh, the winner is based on cumulative overall time. And so we pay out, uh, prize money, uh, to overall, uh, finished position as well as we pay out day money to the top 10 places. Um, and so, the, the race course from Jackson, we go to a, a town called Alpine. It's about 35 or 30 miles from Jackson. And then, um, you know, uh, start moving, uh, east and south. The, the southernmost, uh, race being hosted by the town of Kemmerer. Um, and then, uh, we kind of circle back around and finish back in Teton County. And I, th I think there's, you know, if you're driving the race course from trailhead to trailhead, I, I think there's about six or 700 miles of, of driving wow. involved to get from uh, all the way around the race course by vehicle, I should say, from, from uh, community to community. So I always kind of compare it to the Tour de France to where, you know, they're running a different uh, course each day in a different uh, area. Right. So let's talk about, um, the, you had mentioned the social aspect to this, and I think that that's a big draw for uh, the competitors as well as the spectators, just that whole mushing atmosphere that happens with it, you know, the hanging out and, and, hang, and all of that that goes with it. We're in a different time compared to every other year in, in the mushing world, as of course, as you know, and I know uh, races like Iditarod have come out with really comprehensive plans about how they're going to handle um, their race with, with COVID protocols and whatnot. And I know uh, races like the Fur Rondi have been canceled. Can you give us a breakdown of what you guys are planning on doing? 
Well, our mantra is arrive healthy, uh, use precautions, and get home healthy. So, um, you know, we've, we're using, you know, the, the typical guidelines by the local state governments as far as mass usage and social distancing. Um, we do have a, a testing program uh, that we just put in place. Um, and um, we have limited our, our social functions, like the ceremonial start in Jackson that typically draws five to 6,000 spectators. We canceled that. Um, and then uh, any other social functions that we have are, are either out of doors or in a very large open space. Uh, and we're still kind of reserving the right to, to cancel anything at all that's indoors, uh, depending on where things are at, you know, at that time. Um, We've uh, moved, you know, we've having all of our drivers' meetings out of doors now. Um, typically, we would have a drivers' meeting once every evening uh, at whatever social function we might have, and then another drivers' meeting in the morning at the Trailhead parking lot. And this year, we're doing all our drivers' meeting outdoors. Um, so it's been a lot of planning going into it. Our approach has been, you know, to if, if we feel like we can, you know, uh, safely, you know, put the race on and uh, people are, are willing and uh, to agree to our plan and be responsible, then, then we're going to move forward with the race. I haven't looked at the uh, the roster for, for uh, the upcoming race. Do you have anybody that's traveling internationally and or folks traveling down from Alaska? And how are they... Uh, corresponding with you with, you know, with travel protocols and restrictions and things like that? Yeah, this year we've got uh, six teams coming from Canada. Um, we don't have any teams coming down from Alaska this year, which is atypical. This is the first year in, in ever, maybe, that we haven't had a team from Alaska. Um so what we have done is reached out to uh, uh, the border crossing station that uh, all these mushers would, would cross and uh, inquired as what their criteria is and um, had gotten you know, tentative approval that uh, the competitors will be allowed to cross, the Canadian competitors be able to cross at this crossing. As long as they have their standard, you know, paperwork identification, um, and we've provided them with a letter that that uh, certifies that they are a competitor in the event that they paid an entry fee, that they're competing for prize money, um, with the idea that you know this is in a sense essential travel for for these teams because uh, it's you know part of their occupation. So right now it looks like uh, all of our our Canadian teams ought to be able to make it to Wyoming. That's good to hear because I know that that was a, uh, a point of contention, especially with the Yukon Quest race uh, and, and their travel restrictions to and from uh, Canada and Alaska. Uh, Dan, uh, one last question in regard to the race itself. Have you seen a uh, significant change in sponsor availability or commitment uh, this year compared to years past because of the pandemic? Well, you know, our, our title sponsor is Pedigree Dog Food, and they've been with us for this be their 21st year. And when this uh, the COVID thing first came about, that was one of the first things I did was reached out to them and, and said, hey, we're going to continue to move forward. Are you with us? And, and they said, yeah, we absolutely are. And and they, they have been. They've maintained that position. Um, you know, we are – you know, have been affected somewhat uh, as far as, uh, you know, a certain amount of uh, funding that we received from uh, the town of Jackson uh, for that ceremonial start. Um, but with our title sponsor, uh, they're on board, and our other in-kind sponsors and our, you know, our, our sort of team dog type sponsors on the local level, uh, for the most part, have has been able to stick with us. Uh, I think there's a lot of pride around the race in, in Wyoming. And um, I think we've been doing it long enough that we're kind of uh, part of the, 
the, the culture of Western Wyoming. And what about hotels and restaurants? Uh, I would imagine in these smaller towns that uh, you don't have the Hiltons and the, uh, you know, the Holiday Inns and things like that. How have they been uh, in, re- in regard to the pandemic? Well, I don't handle the lodging, but I know that it's all taken care of, at least from the race crew standpoint. Um, you know, normally we would, we would pair up uh, persons on our race crew and have them share a room this year. Uh, we, we've offered everybody an individual room because of COVID, and I know we've, we've got lodging uh, across the board. You know, again, we've been doing it long enough to where uh, we have relationships with all the lodging establishments uh, around uh, Western Wyoming and the, the communities we go to, and uh, that that has not been a problem. So, Dan, we have just a few minutes left here on our show, and I have a couple of more questions for you. The, the next one is, uh, what have you seen the biggest change in, in, number one, in the race that that you work with itself and in mushing in general? You and I got started in the sport about the same time. I'm really interested to hear uh, both sides of those coins there. Well, I guess as far as changes within this event, um, you know, it's just pretty much the format. You know, it started out as being like 500 mile race over 11 days, and, and now we've got seven days of racing at 30 to 35 miles a day. Um, you know, other than that, I, I don't think the race has changed a whole lot. I mean, uh, it still has kind of a, a family atmosphere around it. Um, there, there's a lot of camaraderie, a lot of sportsmanship. Um, mushers still get a great opportunity to improve their skills just by interacting with other top mushers and, and having that, that top quality vet staff uh, available, uh, uh, you know, each day. Um, and then as far as the overall sport, you know, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm seeing changes uh, within our race where where. We don't see as many uh, Iditarod-type kennels coming down to Wyoming. Um, uh, I don't know. I think, you know, dog care continues to improve um, and, and knowledge and the quality and caliber of, of uh, the sled dogs that people are, are maintaining and caring for. So, uh, Dan, before I ask the last question that I ask all of our guests, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about the documentary that you guys produced uh, on the race. I know it's available uh, on a paywall right now, which is a, a fundraiser for the race itself. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And we're going to put a link into the show notes so people can check that out. Sure. Yeah, so we partnered with uh, Angelus Media. Uh, which is Colby Angelos out of Park City, Utah. And I had seen a, he, he produced a, a documentary on one of the rookie mushers uh, two years ago, Fernando Ramirez. And I was impressed with his videography and his approach to the sport and, and how he was presenting it. And so we started to talk and uh, just, devised a plan to film last year's race and put together a documentary and it's called iconic a pedigree stage stop story and it, it is available uh on vimeo um and uh i think it does a really good job of, of kind of showcasing a race and giving someone an inside look into our event um uh, and i think it's very enjoyable and watchable for anybody whether you're you know interested in mushing or, or not i think it's a great a great film um particularly <laughs> with the budget that we had to work with i think it turned out great excellent yeah i'll definitely put a link to that i'm looking forward to watching that as well dan i always end the show with the same question to all of our guests and that is i'm interested to hear what you have to say because you've done both sides the race side as a director as well as behind the runners or on the runners itself that is if somebody is just getting involved in the sport whether they're going to do uh, dry land or sprint or stage or Iditarod or quest or anything like that, what would be one piece of advice you would give that person? I guess test the waters um, because, 
you know, there is so much uh, commitment involved uh, to to caring for the dogs and training, and you know, uh, a lot of times it's it's hard work, but um, you know, there are those moments uh, out on the trail with your team that uh, are are pretty special. You know, I've I've said that I've had some of the 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 toughest days of my life. Uh, out on the trail, and I've also had some of the most memorable, memorable, enjoyable days in my life out on the trail. Um, so I'd say you're going to get out of it what you put into it. Excellent. Dan, is there anything else that you would like to mention before we go? Um, just uh, if anybody is interested in following the stage stop this year, um, you know, check out our website. And we are uh, producing daily video content that will be uploaded uh uh, each evening, so you will be able to, to follow the stage stop with video updates and, and commentary by uh, Jerry Bath and Sebastian Schnuley, our race commentators. Um, so if, if what you've heard today sounds interesting, uh, you can find out more just by following the race. Excellent. On behalf of my guest today, Dan Carter, he's the race director for the Pedigree Stage Stop. This is Robert Forto. We will see you guys next time. Goodbye. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company. Learn more at firstpaw.coffee. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe too. Your hosts are Alex Stein and Robert Forto. Our producer is Robert Forto, created for Dog Works Radio. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forda and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com.